the last quarter of the uh, Old Testament, the first three quarters, the last quarter of that one is prophets. So immediately you have to let your, you know, as they would say in the yellow pages, you let your finger do the walking. You have to let your fingers do the walking in finding uh, um, places in scripture. And for most Bibles, if you, if somebody says, well, something is in uh, Psalms, and somebody picks up their Bible and uh, and they just go like that, and boom, there it is. How, how did he? How did I find able to find Psalms? Because it's right in the middle. <laughs> so your fingers know where where the where the books are. And so if somebody get, it wants you to quote something in the, in the New Testament from Paul, you immediately go back in this area, and there you go. Didn't do bad, 2 Corinthians. <laughs> My fingers know where the books are. You learn that. In, so I've seen cases where somebody has uh, uh, said something was in Psalms, and the person there, they had their Bible, and they just went boom, and they opened it up, and, and what are you even looking at? And saying, well, well, I'm at Psalm uh, 43 here, and I go back, and then somebody said, wow, how did you do that? Well, because they, their fingers knew that the Psalms were right about the middle. So we want to learn to use your fingers to. <clears throat> now... The Old Testament. Now let's go through the 27 books of the uh, New Testament. There, let's get the first handful. What's the first handful? The Gospels. The Gospels and a history book called Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and a history book called Acts. You'll know the five, first five right now. Boom, boom, you got it. Now, uh, Paul wrote letters to nine communities, nine places. And those, a uh, 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 little key to remember those is real Christians go everywhere proclaiming Christ. Real Christians go everywhere proclaiming Christ. R is for Romans. Romans. Uh, plural Christians is for two Corinthians. Corinthians. One and two. Go is G for Galatians. Everywhere E is for Ephesians. Uh, um, proclaiming P is for Philippians. And remember, the Filipinos are not supposed to claim this. I, every now and again, you get them up in the thing and they'll read, uh, a letter of Paul to the Philippines. <laughs> no. <laughs> you put the emphasis on the flip, okay? The Philippians. <laughs> And uh, then you have, uh, and then the, uh, C is for Colossians. And telling truth is Thessalonians 1, Thessalonians 2. Then Paul wrote uh, uh, four letters to people, individuals. And uh, the, he wrote uh, one to Timothy, two to Timothy, T for Titus, and P for Philemon, triple T P, triple T P. Those are his letters to to persons. And then there's a letter to to the uh, to the Hebrews. It's a letter to Christians. And uh, those uh, uh, and it is called you just call it Hebrews. Some books uh, Bibles will say a letter of uh, Saint Paul to the Hebrews. Others argue that Paul didn't write it. It was Someone else wrote it. So they let the big scripture scholars argue about it, but it was a book either to Jewish converts to Christianity or to Jewish people. And then there was what is called the Catholic epistles. And you learn that with the kind of the waltz, one, two, three, one. It's JP, JJ, one, two, three, one. JP is James and Peter. James wrote one, Peter wrote two. J.J. is John and Jude. John wrote three. Jude wrote one. And then the book of Revelation at the end. And um, so those, this kind of goes through that again now. The handful. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, history book called Acts. The nine letters Paul wrote to places. Romans, Corinthians 1 and 2. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Uh, a letter to Jewish people, Hebrews. And, and that's what Ray was talking about that book last night when he said, he said in the Bible, men are supposed to put the coffee on. So I got up and put the coffee on this morning because it says <laughs> Hebrews. <laughs> and uh, then there's the, the uh, what is called the Universal Catholic Epistles or Letters. And they are James, Peter 1 and 2, John 1, 2, 3, and Jude 1. And the book of Revelation. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna test everybody tonight. <sighs> Are we gonna ever test anybody tonight? Now, I want to to uh, to talk the, the today this morning about. There's a passage that Peter used when everybody thought the apostles were were drunk and uh, uh, carrying on like charismatics. Uh, they. <laughs> Uh, and they said that the, the, even the people knowing that what they were hearing was unexplainable, they mock it. One of the common things is to mock. Satan is a mocker. That's why, that's why the Psalm 1 says, do not sit in the seat of scoffers. And so they're saying, ah, oh, this is just not, these guys are drunk. And Peter says, no. This is what the prophet Joel talked about. In those days, the Lord God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And their young men and maidens will prophesy. Their young will have visions and their old will have dreams. There will be signs in the sky and whatever. In those days. And it goes on, it will come to pass in those days, says the Lord God, that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. It's important to remember that. Oppressed by the enemy, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be delivered. Now, let's take a jump from there and go right back to the beginning in Genesis. Now, in, uh, God created the heavens. Remember, heavens is plural. We know there's at least three because Paul talks about having been taken up to the third heaven. And we know that uh, Paul also will tell that there will be evil in heavenly places. That maybe in somewhere in that second heaven, <clears throat> the activity of evil goes on. We know that. And so, uh, what we're finding uh, in in the in the book of Genesis, right at the very beginning, God uh, says God created the heavens and the earth, and we're having <clears throat> the singular and plural. God is one, and he creates as more than one. That we, like we have verbs in, in English we do. We'll talk about the, the man walks to the store. We put an S on it. And then on the other hand, we, we say the men walk to the store. We have more than one, then we leave the S off, right? The word walk is, is the plural verb. So God sets at the beginning that he is more than one. And he's going to reveal himself as one God and three persons. Now, when God does his creation, what does he do? He goes through all the things that, uh, that are, uh, he creates and sets the days. There was this day, the second day, the third day, and the fourth day. And on the sixth day, God creates Stones and rocks? No. He creates the human. He said it, and it says it in this way. Uh, we will create someone in our own image, in our own likeness. An image is something that reflects. And uh, a likeness is something that's similar to. So when God creates, it says he created male and female Male and female, he created them. And they were in his image and likeness. Created in the image of God. An image reflects. And we're in the image of God to reflect the goodness of the Father, the truth of the Son, and the harmony and beauty of the Holy Spirit. 
Every one of you here was created to reflect the goodness of the Father, the truth of the Son, and the harmony and beauty of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is it to be created in the likeness of God? God has revealed himself as a triune God. One God, three persons. One God, three persons. You are created by God to be a triune person. You are one person. Three parts. That's why you are in the likeness of God. He is one God, three persons. You are, uh, and those three persons are in beautiful harmony. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you are created to be a triune person. One person, three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. And as the three persons in God are in beautiful harmony, you are to have beautiful harmony between your body, your soul, and your spirit. Now, if you're going to have beautiful harmony, you've got to feed all three. Yeah, I just fed the body there a while ago. <laughs> and he did some singing here, and we goofed around a little bit. And that was good for your soul, your psyche. You feel comfortable here. And, uh, and, and your feelings, that's your soul, that's the Greek word. We often just threw spirit and soul in together sometimes. But uh, your spirit comes from the breath of God. Because the spirit of each one of you is different, a little bit like your bodies are all different, you know? There's none of you got a beard like mine. <laughs> you, uh, and, and yet, your spirit is from the breath of God. God said in Genesis, he formed the man, and then he did what? He breathed into him. Man became a living being in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, uh, we, uh, uh, we need to take a look at the triune person. And we must, uh, and it also says, you know, that one of the translations, uh, some of them translate a little bit different, but it said, God, he is jealous. Well, that's a pretty heavy word to use about God. He, he is uh, uh, jealous about the spirit that he has placed in mankind. That's why, you know how, you know how serious God is about that? He says, Jesus says, you know, don't scandalize one of these little ones, eh? Because their Heavenly Father, he, he didn't, didn't add that, but he put that in that context text. He is saying, your Heavenly Father is very jealous about that spirit he has breathed in that child. And you better not mess that spirit up. That's how serious God takes each one of us. He even goes so far as to say, if you harm the spirit of a child... That's, that's part of the breath of God. Then he said, it must be better for you to have a millstone around your neck and be cast into the sea. Pretty, pretty uh, serious stuff, eh? And this is why we have to, to make sure that we keep our spirit healthy, our body healthy, and our emotions healthy. Now, we also know that in some times they tell us that if a little baby doesn't get any touching, mm -hmm. even yeah. it'll what? die. That body needs to be loved. The soul needs to be loved. And the spirit needs to be loved. Now we need to feed all three of them. And we feed, we just, at the cafeteria we just fed our body. We talked about a little bit of scripture that uh, you picked up before. That's, that Jesus says that uh, you live by the, every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's, that's food for your spirit. We have a, a saying that we often use, uh, uh, the family that Pray prays together stays, stays together. <clears throat> Why? Because when you pray together, something happens. Jesus says, when two or more come together in my name, I am there. 
and his, uh, his presence unites our spirits together in prayer. You can't go out and mouth against somebody that you spend time praying with. No, because there's a, a unity that happens in prayer that brings your spirits one with Jesus. <clears throat> and the three things, the word of God and, and prayer, and uh, what's the third thing that feeds your spirit? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. Jesus ties that into the born again reality. You know, we use, we use the, the book here to, uh, to uh, uh, say that those 27 books are the We use the word New Testament, but to be exact, we should say those 27 books are the books of the New Testament. Why do I make the distinction? Because what is the New Testament? The Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. Jesus took the cup and he said, first of all, he said, uh, uh, take this and eat, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And this is a cup of my blood of the new and eternal covenant. Remember that first covenant with Adam? The last is with the new Adam. And I'm going to have a, a little handout there. Maybe I'll get them at near the end. Uh, the, the nine exchanges that took place on the cross. Nine exchanges. He became sin so that we may have the righteousness of God. He took our punishment that we might go free. He took our poverty. It says he didn't shriek from the, and shrink from the, uh, uh, the poverty of the cross. He was paying a debt that he did not owe for us who have a debt that we could not pay. And so he took the poverty of us so that we may have the abundance of the obedient Jesus. He took the curse that we might be set free from the curse. It says he, in Galatians it said, uh, Christ Jesus became a curse so that we might be set free from the curse of the law. For, and a, uh, Paul quotes the Old Testament, for cursed is he who is hanged upon a tree. And then Paul goes on to say, so that all the blessings promised to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. He took nine exchanges for us. All the things that belong to the obedient race of Adam, which we are part of, Jesus had heaped upon him that he may become, uh, that we may become uh, uh, recipients of the things that belong to the obedient Jesus, not the things that belong to us as a rebellious uh, uh, descendant race of Adam. Following me? Yes. That exchange took place. Now, let's go into flesh. Uh, in, in looking at uh, flesh, we, we come down, it, it is one of the three parts of the triune being. And the devil will really get us uptight about our flesh, eh? And I want to tell you a, a story before, and I still remember it. Uh, I worked in hospital ministry for 20-some years. I saw a lot of people die. Been with a lot of people dying. And uh, to tell you, two of the, one of the times down in near Medicine Hat, I, uh, there was a woman, an old woman in her 90s, and she was getting around 90 anyway, but she had, her sister died in Medicine Hat, and I offered my uh, condolences, and she said, she looked at me, and so very peacefully, she said, do you know, Father, we will all get our opportunity. 
And then we just had a workshop in Yellowknife, and uh, uh, Bishop Ricardo, uh, a retired bishop from a diocese in New Mexico, he was talking about his grandmother, who was 90 some years old, and, and uh, uh, he was talking to her on the phone, like, and he's 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 a bishop then, and so she's he was learning some theology from Grandma, <laughs> and Grandma was talking all over there, like we had four or five people in the community die in the last month, you know, and she said, you know, we've been getting together and we're doing some prayer and we're doing this and we're all having such a great time, all having a wonderful time, and and he kind of said, well, you know, Grandma, there's. Five people died in the community, and, and you're you're having a great time. And she said, "Don't you know it's a privilege to die?" Awesome, isn't it? The old woman said, "We'll all get our opportunity," and and the other one said, "Don't you know?" Telling her grandson, a bishop, "Don't you know?" It was something like Jesus saying to Nicodemus, "You know, Nicodemus." You a teacher in Israel, and you don't know these things about being born again. <laughs> Almost like that. First thing I thought when he, t when Bishop Ricardo uh, uh, said that, I was thinking of Jesus and Nicodemus. Here is Grandma, who's 90 years old, saying to her grandson, a bishop, "Don't you know it's a privilege to die?" <laughs> you see, because uh, and one other little story was this: my mom. And my Aunt Lizzie and my Aunt Nellie were talking. And Mom was, well, she was the junior of the three sisters that were still left in the family. She was kind of, I think, 70 or 71. And uh, my Aunt Lizzie was, um, uh, no, Mom was 80, I think 81. Aunt Lizzie was 89. And my Aunt Nellie was 91. And they're talking about somebody had died in the community. And my Aunt Lizzie, she was always different. She, every, every family got an Aunt Lizzie somewhere. <laughs> she was the one when it came time for, to get her old age pension. She said, no, no, I can't sign that. You know, the government can't afford that. <laughs> and, uh, but it, she would say things that, that were, and when she was talking about somebody who died, she said, do you know, when I think of dying, it scares me to death. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Mom said to her, she was a junior of the three, she said, well, Lizzie, why would it scare you to death? Well, you know, and my Aunt Lizzie was somebody who, even on her arthritic knees, prayed for an hour every day. And, 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 and my mom said, Lizzie, what do you mean you don't know where you're going to go? Well, you never, and I, I have no idea, and I, I don't know where I'm going to go. And Aunt Nellie pipes up, she's the one in the 90s, and she says, for heaven's sakes, Lizzie, what do you mean you don't know where you're going to go? <laughs> My Aunt Nellie at 90-something, she knew where she was going to go. And this is why sometimes we, we uh, 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 the world tells us that there's everything wrong about the flesh. Read, look at the ads. Oh, things that'll take away the wrinkles, right? <laughs> oh, yes, you know. All kinds. Now, I want to tell you about wrinkles. Uh, two weeks ago, this Monday, or it'll be a week ago last Monday, I had a, a funeral for Clara. Clara was an old Denny elder, and she had wrinkles and wrinkles all over her face. And only a few months before in Fort Simpson, Maggie had the same. And when they died, there was not a wrinkle on their body. Wow. On, their, on even the hands, the wrinkles all disappeared. And the face, just like that of a child. And I've seen that over and over again. That even in the mystery of death, God does something profound. I call it the heavenly facelift. <laughs> and God is... <laughs> and he does, he does it to old men, too. He does it to even younger. But, but you know, you know one person some of you may know. Remember Father Pat O'Byrne? 
and uh, he was uh, Bishop O'Byrne's older brother. And, uh, and Pat uh, uh, was always a great champion of those who were the underdogs. That was one of the things that Father Pat was. And, um, and uh, I uh, went over to Boyac. I got a call to the general and to Boyac. And they said at the general any time through the day to anoint someone. So, so I went over to Pat. And I knew Pat well. And I had done some deliverances with Pat. I thought it was neat, you know, he was that wavy that he could hardly stand up. And he was ordering <laughs> in a spirit away from somebody. But anyhow, I went over to Pat and kind of woke him up and said, Pat, it's Bernie. Now it's time for you to listen to Jesus and quit digging your heels in. Jesus wants you to go home. <clears throat> Anointed him, came back, went over to the general, came back, and Pat had died. He died about 10 minutes after he was anointed. And I walk into the room, <clears throat> and all at once I start looking around. Am I in the wrong room? <clears throat> And some, uh, yeah, look, and Father Pat's stuff was there. And then somebody that was with him when he died came in and said, he sure changed, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. And that change remained on him that even in his casket, there was a lot of people said, how come they couldn't make Father Pat look like Father Pat? Because <laughs> Father Pat had had a profound experience when he dies. And there's a precedent for that in scripture. Anybody want to take a guess at where it is? The Acts of the Apostles, where they're, they're uh, after Stephen. And it said his face became to look like that of a angel. an angel. And then as they're stoning him, he says, I see the throne of God. I see the heavens opening and the glory of the throne of God. See, when they, those two ladies, Maggie and Clara, <clears throat> and I've seen this many, many times, When they were dying, they were having a vision so profound that their countenance changed like Stephen's. God is saying, I am the God that loves you. And I love you in your spirit, in your soul, and in your body. It's always awesome to look at someone, especially when you know them before. And you know that their face had just filled with wrinkles. And you look, and everything is, uh, um, all the wrinkles are gone. So at Clara's funeral, I got everybody's attention by saying, well, you know, when Clara died, there was something missing. Of course, everybody, well, like, what was this we didn't hear about? And I said, all her wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> And it's the way God tells the community that in the great mystery of death, that's why, that's why uh, Bishop Ricardo's grandmother could say, you know, don't you realize it's a privilege to die? Or, Father, we'll all get our opportunity. Because you die only in one part of you. Of the three parts of you, only the body dies, and that is temporarily. On the glorious day of the Lord, yet that's why scripture refers to death as having fallen asleep. They, so that uh, we, we fall, haven't fallen asleep believing in Jesus. Death is often spoken of having fallen asleep. David fell asleep and was laid to rest with his ancestors. Because your death in your body is only going to be temporary. Now, coming back to Joel in the passage. In those days the Lord God said I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Go back to Genesis again. And God in, in his six days God created his creation. And what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. He rested. He, did he have a good snooze? No. To rest in scripture in the Old Testament means to abide with. Remember the, uh, the man that had the different talents given to him when the master comes back and he said, good and, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over small things. Come and enter into your master's rest. Come and abide with me. Stay with me. Stay at my place. 
And so to abide, God would abide with his creation. And, and, and that is why we have that image of him coming down to walk in the garden in the cool of the evening because God and Adam and Eve were friends. Later we'll find that great spiritual walk People will say to me, well, maybe I'm having the dark night of the soul. But the most extolled journey with God was our spiritual father in faith. Who is our spiritual father in faith? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> Abraham, Abraham is your father in faith. We are the, the children of Abraham through Jesus. He's our father in faith. He's a father in faith for all our, our Jewish brothers and sisters. And so, um, God had a, what kind of relationship with Adam? It was said of Abraham that he was a friend of God. God said, I can't go down and destroy those two cities until I talk to my friend, Abraham. And you and I, following the pattern of our father in faith, we are to see God as our friend. God is our friend. Now, then coming back into the, uh, the... So God had that wonderful creation of the garden. And then what happened? Satan came in and he got Adam and Eve to sin in the flesh. As well as in their heart. To rebel and rebellion. And rebellion brought separation. And God couldn't compromise with, with sin. God doesn't compromise with sin. It's important to know that. But remember also, Jesus paid for your sin, and if you repent, God says, I will place your sins as far away from you as the east is from the west. I will remember them no longer. He says, I will cast them into the sea of my forgetfulness. God wants to forgive you much more than you want to be forgiven. And so, then, we, ha we find in, they were moved out of the garden. And the first uh, the first prophecy of God, his word, that he was going to redeem us, was made to whom? The first prophecy of our salvation was made to... To that guy called Lucifer who was uh, shape-shifting as a serpent. And he... Uh, he had, um, um, you're hearing a buzz? That's just my cell phone. <laughs> and and um, so the first was given to Satan, and God said to Satan after he had put Adam and Eve out of the garden and, and spoke the things against that there would be for them because of their sin, then he said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. The woman. <clears throat> Between your seed and her seed. And her seed is going to be what? Not an angel, but flesh. Going to be flesh. Just like you and I are flesh. The descendant of the woman. Virgin birth. He's, but even at that first one, he is, is saying there's going to be a virgin birth. And it's going to be a seed of a woman. And that seed of a woman is flesh. And that flesh you will kick it at his heel and, and bruise his heel, but he is going to what? Crush your head. And God is saying to Satan, I, you messed up my last creation. Now I'm going to do a new creation. And uh, we, there's a passage in scripture that says, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. I was doing that up in Hay River, and I kept the people all the time, all the time I was there. And then I was doing a mass up in Yellowknife on a Saturday night for, for Father Ben, and he, uh, 
And so I saw this four or five people from Hay River right there in the group, you know, ah, and they didn't let me down. <laughs> I used that passage and said, now, can anybody in here in the church here finish this passage? If anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are. And every, they, the, the five or six people from Hay River come out in full volume. They have a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. God was going to do a new creation through the flesh of his son. And so Christ Jesus came in the flesh, suffered and died in the flesh, rose from the dead in the flesh, ascended as son of Mary to the glory of the throne of heaven. And he will come again as glorious king, son of Mary, son of the eternal father at the end of the age for victory. God was faithful telling Satan, I'm going to crush your kingdom through flesh. Now, where does it come in with you and me? Where does our flesh come in? Uh, that in and that is why Peter at Pentecost uh, does that uh, uh, statement. These men are not drunk. These men, what is happening to them is what the prophet Joel said. In those days, the Lord God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And their young men and maidens will prophesy. Their young will have visions and their old men will have dreams. Sometimes I don't know whether I get that mixed around, but now I'm old, it's only dreams I get. <laughs> and then we... Uh, He pours out his spirit upon all flesh. Now, that is because that makes your flesh part of the new creation of God. He, he will he restores through the flesh of Jesus. He wants to carry out the restoration and the victory through your flesh and my flesh. Now, in scripture we have. The Spirit of God can be in various ways. The Spirit of God, it said, of Cyrus. Even though he did not know the Lord God, the Spirit of the Lord was with him. Then it talks about Jesus comes at the day of resurrection. He comes into the upper room where they are, and what does he do? He breathed on them the breath of God. Breath. And said, receive the Holy Spirit, who's, and, and he goes on with more, but he said, and they received what is called the born again life. Sometimes, you know, they, uh, uh, um, somebody will come up to you and you say, have you been saved? Yes. And just off on another little tangent, but there was a young man. And I went to see somebody from Siksika that was in the, uh, just last summer. And it was, uh, it was in the Foothills Hospital. And, uh, and since then, Bonnie has gone to the Lord. But she has, uh, but I was waiting, and you know how they, they've overgrown that hospital, and you've you got to stand in a great big area where those elevators are, and before you can get moving to an elevator, it's full. And I, oh, I learned the secret. When you go into the foothills, you just get up by one elevator and you don't move. And it doesn't matter how many of the others open, you don't move because yours is going to open and then you're going to be the first one in. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was standing in the crowd and this young man, this young man came up to me and, and he, uh, and well, he maybe thought I was kind of harmless looking or, or out of it like looking or something. And he came up close to me and he had these little tracks in his hand. And he said, uh, sir, do you know Jesus? <laughs> and uh, he was probably sent out on the mission to go out and do this, you know. Do you know Jesus? And I said, oh, you bet I know Jesus. And I didn't do it super loud, <laughs> but I did. So, you bet I know Jesus. And then he was kind of... and. Uh, and, uh, and he said, they said, you're born again. And I said, yes, born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Praise be Jesus. <laughs> and people around could hear it. And the young man, uh, kind of, and then he came over and he moved up close to me. And you know what he said to me? Sir, would you pray for me that I will never be afraid to tell anyone about Jesus? 
maybe God put me on his path <laughs> to give him a sense to be brave. <laughs> that I wasn't going to be hiding that I didn't, didn't know Jesus. And so sometimes God puts us on our, on our, our path. Uh, just a one little one about Rosemary there. I, I met her at the bus depot in Calgary. How many years ago? It must be back in the 70s, wasn't it? And she was, she was on her way to the bus, and then she was going to go to, to, uh, to, to Haiti. And uh, somebody asked me to go over to the bus depot and pray with her, so I went over, and, uh, and she couldn't wonder afterwards why I was praying for one particular thing for her. And I was praying for her protection. She was like, I'm just heading off to Haiti. What, what do you need protection for? Mm -hmm. She landed there the day of the revolution. Rising against the devaluation, the we didn't know if we could even get out of the country. Everything was up in the air. So you see that I, I, the Holy Spirit was telling me what to ask for. Yeah. That she needed, she was going into a scene where she needed to be protected, and she, because of God's protection, she's running the camera today. Yeah. <laughs> and was I ever grateful? Just, and so those are things that God lets us lead. But coming back to the to the um, to the flesh, they uh, then we talked about the Holy Spirit giving us the born again life. That's the Spirit dwelling within us, making us a new creation in Jesus. Then the Scriptures tell us there's another way that the Holy Spirit comes to us comes upon us, and it comes upon our body. All the, those, those, uh, those nine anointings, and the, actually the, the, the uh, King James doesn't use, it uh, uses the word gift, but it puts the word gift in, in italics, because anybody that speaks different languages, you always say, well, I, I know how to say this in German, but I don't know how to say it in English. <laughs> and they may speak both languages, because there are certain things that, and that in the Greek, it doesn't really use a word that is translated completely by gift. Because I, uh, a gift, when a gift is given, uh, ownership changes. Like in other words, if I take that, take a, 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 I've used this as an example, if I take a camera and I, I give it to somebody in the parish before I leave and I say, well, Joe, you can have my camera. The camera becomes Joe's. If I leave it in the sacristy and go away as if I've forgotten it, people will come and use it and they'll say, is Father Bernie's camera in the, in the sacristy? Everybody uses it. People who forget the camera for baptism, they all say, is Father Bernie's camera still in the sacristy? I still have ownership, right? All the users don't take ownership. But if I give it to somebody, it's their ownership. And that is why the King James, for one, puts the word gifts in italics. It's not really the full meaning of gift, but it is an anointing. And it, the, the, the Spirit gives us an anointing that comes upon us. And it comes upon our bald head. <laughs> comes upon our flesh. And there are nine of those anointings that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. And they are a word, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Those are ones to do with your head. Then, God doesn't leave your mouth out. <laughs> there are three that belong to your mouth. Prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And the three that belong, as it were, almost to your inner being. They are faith, that's faith that expects the impossible of God. We got a few popes that do that. John Paul, St. John Paul II, he, he was a nightmare. 
to uh, security people. He could see some little kid over at the fence with some, some flowers. He just break right out and go over to the kid and take the flowers and give the kid a blessing. And everybody in security went, oh, the adrenaline was going up and the, t the pressure, you know, like he stepped out of the... He was expecting, God will take care of me if I go over to see the kid. God will take care of me. For well, Francis went to the Middle East. Didn't want any extra security because God will take care of him. It's a kind of faith, we see it in some people, and it's a faith that expects the impossible of God. And then there's healing and miracles. Now the danger of calling these gifts is that we want to take ownership of them. And uh, uh, like uh, the pr priest said the fire was coming at the hamlet where he lived, and he, uh, he, uh, uh, and everybody was getting evacuated out and so on, and the f uh, fire was coming, and he put on his cassock and his surplice and his little purple stole, took his bottle of holy water, and he walked out there and he shouted, Fire! In the name of the Lord Jesus, stop! And the wind immediately switched. And now he was anointed by the power of the Spirit for to perform a miracle. Miracle is different than healing. And there's, there's all kinds of people that have hands laid on them. Because, and healing, because God the Father at the garden chose to continue to bless through flesh. Bless through flesh. Your flesh. This is why it's always important to know that your body, no matter how many wrinkles it's got, no how many bumps it's got on it, your body is a dwelling place and workshop of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what charismatic is all about. It's not that God is doing something nice for you, it's God is going to use you to do something nice for somebody. This is why we've got to get the whole sense of the, the anointings of the Spirit away from us. They are placed upon us so that we may build up the body of Christ. We, our body is the instrument. Paul, the scripture says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? A dwelling place of the Spirit of the living God. And uh, we, uh, Paul makes sure, he says, he says, you know, we carry these treasures in what? Vessels of clay. This body is a vessel of clay. It'll, it'll rot in the earth someday. So anything that this body does, laying hands on people for healing, I have to remember that the greatness of the glory belongs to God. And maybe a little grateful that he uses this guy who doesn't really deserve to be counted, as Paul says, you know. Paul, Paul had talked about himself as what? The chief among sinners. Uh, I, uh, I know a chief in one of the communities, and he, uh, uh, he, he, he basically has, he, he has his Bible all... Uh, uh, um, uh, highlighted, you know, and so I tease him. Then again, I say, uh, Alec, is is that stuff you got underlined? Is is it the stuff you believe or you don't agree with? <laughs> <laughs> and then I always introduce him to somebody, and I'll say, uh, Alec, he, he's the chief among sinners. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, he knows he knows scripture oh a lot, lot better than I do, and <clears throat> and he was. He was a street drunk at one time. I know another guy knows a lot. He was a street drunk too. And, and he makes you cry when he, when he uh, uh, sings, And Jesus signed my pardon. Awesome now in God. Because they accepted that no matter how broken their body was, that it could be a temple and a workshop for the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do about how good and wonderful you are. It is because the Father chose 
to let your body be an instrument to restore what was lost in the garden and to give back even more. That is why Satan likes to do, likes to do things to the body. I used to be puzzled in about reading about the uh, uh, the Nazis. Why do they go to all this work of building great big concentration camps and all these things and all that expense and that? They could have just taken everybody and lined them up and shot them and, and threw them into the open pit, right? A lot cheaper, a lot less things to do. Why? Why? Because Satan loves to have the human body attacked. That is why it is said of, of Jesus in Isaiah, he was marred beyond all recognition. Sometimes our crucifixes are very cosmetic. <laughs> Jesus was beaten beyond recognition because Satan hates flesh. He hated Jesus' flesh because he knew that the one, the flesh that came from the virgin birth was going to crush his kingdom. And he also knows that our flesh, which is anointed by the power of the Spirit, will also bring about victory over his kingdom. Jesus said in Mark's Gospel, These are the signs that will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will do this and this. And in my name they will lay hands on those who are sick and they shall recover. Like one man I saw in here one time, he prayed over somebody at the hospital. He was a guy, a hard uh, laborer, and, and, he, and the person was healed, and he stood there and cried. He never thought that God would ever use his, his calloused hands to bring healing to somebody. But he was open enough to lay his hands on somebody and to pray for healing. And the Holy Spirit did the rest of it. So we need to know the dignity of our flesh. Satan will always tell us, uh, the things of our flesh that aren't perfect, but the Holy Spirit uses our flesh. Did you ever, did you ever realize the meaning of intercessory prayer? Kids sometimes will, will put you to say, they'll say, well, why do we have to pray? Doesn't God know what we need? <clears throat> but at the garden, the Father decided that there would be, there would be blessings given that would come only through flesh. Your flesh and my flesh. And that is why anytime you see anyone that's sick, you don't have to make a big performance. You can make say, maybe we should have a little word of prayer. That's a beautiful expression for people. It's not threatening. We have a little word of prayer. And I want to tell you, maybe as I close, and there are a whole lot of more things I could tell you, but this one happened in a hospital that I went to one time, and I had been in that hospital before, and I had gone in, and the uh, director of, of uh, pastoral care said to me, he said, Bernie, maybe you should go up to palliative care and take a crack at this one. <laughs> and because uh, everybody that tried to talk to this woman about, about her, uh, uh, she was dying. Anytime they wouldn't be death, she would throw them out of the room. Doctors, pastoral care people, everybody. So he was just doing a last-ditch effort. Maybe he thought I needed to be humiliated a little bit or something. <laughs> he said, why don't you go up and take a crack at this one? She's throwing everybody out. So as, uh, as uh, I went up and I thought, well, I'll pray as I go up. So I go wandering and total stranger, tell her that I live in a community uh, somewhere else and I was in, in to see somebody from my town and uh, I saw her name downstairs and thought I would just come up and, and say hello. And she kind of said hello. She was sitting in a chair. And I ch checked her for a few minutes. And then I said, um, would it be okay if we did a little word of prayer? Oh, all the bristles come up. And she, she said, I've been in this chair so long, and those nurses are supposed to have me back in the bed. And uh, well, she was given, and I said, oh, I wasn't going to do a big, long prayer. I was just going to do a 10-second one. <laughs> and she said, Yes. And I put my hands on her, and I'm sure I didn't go past the 10 seconds. And I just asked the Lord Jesus, by his power, to touch her. And all the tears started coming down. And she looked at me, and she said, Reverend, I'm going to die. 
And I said, I'll be honest, that's why I come up to see you. <laughs> and we're going to help you to die with, with, with uh, getting all things connected with Jesus. And I said, is it okay for those other people from pastoral care to come up and pray with you? Or to be really good, you know? And she was, she was happy. And I said, I'll come back in to see you again. And I came back in a couple of times, and she was a whole new person in Jesus. I always call that, we laughed and joked about it, as a 10-second miracle. The Holy Spirit, does it, he could have done it in two seconds. <laughs> or one second. Because when she said yes, she opened herself. And then the power from the Holy Spirit transformed her and changed her. Now, she might have died in desperation had I not gone up there and be willing to get thrown out. Get willing to be thrown out. And sometimes we have to, to reach out even when it's difficult. Like that young man at the elevator there in the foothills, he was willing to reach out. You could tell he was as timid as can be. He was sent out to give some tracks, and he maybe had a few people growl at him, and then all at once, somebody said something that would change maybe his life forever. God wants to use your flesh to do his work and that is why intercessory prayer, sometimes when you get a whole lot of people starting to pray and asking the Father for a blessing for somebody, boom! Flesh is asking for it. And the Father intends to restore and reestablish and make all things new in Christ Jesus through the action of his Holy Spirit. So those are enough ramblings and... Uh, um, then I hope I don't break uh, Rosemary's camera. <laughs> but remember, God uh, is a person, God is a, as a divine God, has a love for each one of you. Doesn't matter whether you're old or young, doesn't matter whether you've been like Paul, chief among sinners. You see, Paul could say, I'm, I'm a chief among sinners. And then he could say, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And then Paul could say again, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. There remains only for me the crown that the Lord just judge will give to me on that day. All the Holy Spirit is asking you to be obedient and let him use your body. With anointings that come from him and belong to him and always will belong to him. And he will always surprise you now and again too. And one more miracle to tell about. I was, in, I was still in the city of Calgary, and somebody from a uh, high level called me to pray for their dad who was going to have surgery in, in, in Edmonton. And I had some relatives at Edmonton, and I thought, I'll go up and visit them and I'll pray with this guy. Well, I get a call on Saturday night. Dad is on his way down to Edmonton. He's going to be in such an hotel, and he's going to, uh, um, and could you go up and pray with him? Well, I had two Masses Sunday morning and a Bible teaching at OLPH in the afternoon. I got somebody to go with me. We went up and found them in the, in the hotel room. And in the hotel room were a whole lot of, they were probably great-grandchildren. Little, little guys, you know, kids. And they were playing around the room. And so I get him on the, sit on the bed, great-grandpa on the bed. And I get all the kids up and everybody there. And we're all going to lay hands on grandpa. And we're going to ask Jesus to heal him. Grandpa had a big tumor in his bladder and one on, in one of his kidneys. And all these little guys out in face with their hands on great grandpa, you know. He went in for surgery the next day, no tumors at all. And he's still living today. See? I just wondered which one of those little guys <laughs> that the Holy Spirit used. Maybe if I hadn't got them all in my, they don't, all their hands on, maybe... An anointing may not have come, but it did come through one of them. Yeah. And um, people who do healing ministry will always tell you, don't count the children out. 
And if you're praying with somebody for healing, guess what? Children love to be there. And there's some others that love to be there too. The dog and the cat. <laughs> oh, don't, don't call that out. Animals are very sensitive to the action and the power of the Spirit of God. They're much more sensitive sometimes than we are. And you go into a family and you're praying about a problem in the family and if you get everybody in prayer, it isn't too long till the dog moves into the middle and the cat moves in and they want to just be there because they feel that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That's what scripture says, you know, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And it was just like the family that they were, they were everybody in the family was sick and there was a new minister had come. And it was his first Sunday there, and there was only one boy. He was uh, he was uh, he didn't well, he wasn't sick. So they thought they would send him to church with the neighbors. So when he came back home, of course they all wanted to know what the new pastor was like, and what was his sermon like. And the kids said, you know, his sermon was like the peace of God. It surpassed all understanding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>